Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Terry White, Worldwide Design and Photography Evangelist here at Adobe. It's my pleasure to be streaming to you live once again for part two of what we kicked off yesterday, how to be creative on mobile. First, a quick check-in. I just want to know, how's everyone doing? Um, I know many of you have been inside for many weeks, and we all appreciate that. And I've been inside for weeks as well, just taking a daily walk by myself with my dog. Uh, but other than that, uh, we have all been in this together. So welcome, everyone. I hope that you're doing okay. I hope that you're surviving this. I hope that you are uh, both physically and mentally um, healthy. So with that said, uh, today we're going to continue with part two about being creative on mobile. I hope that this serves as a good distraction from all the things that are going on in the world. And hopefully even in your world that you're learning new things and you're thinking about trying new things um, because this will not last forever. So once this is over, you'll have all these good techniques and things to go out and try. And many of them you can try even from home while you're working or while you're relaxing, whatever it is you're doing. Uh, so I see a bunch of folks uh, coming into the chat. Thank you for being here. Uh, Colby, Sean, Victoria, Carolyn, John, Steve, Thomas, Tim. Hey, Tim, what's going on, Steve? Uh, Steve, I said Steve, <laughs> Thomas. I see a bunch of folks even on uh, Facebook, on, or I see Renee, Michelle, Mark, uh, Billy, and Mary. If you're watching this on another platform, you're watching this directly on YouTube, you're watching it on Facebook or Twitter or whatever you're watching it on, that's all great, but I'm going to really focus my attention to the one chat over on behance.net slash live. So if you want to participate in the chat, you have questions, you want to, want to talk along the way, then head over to behance.net slash live because I, if I glance and I see something I can quickly address on the other chats, I will, but that'll be the chat that I'll be focused on. So I'll be like focused right there. All right. Um, with that said, <clears throat> Here on Adobe Live, it isn't just about the one show in the morning. I wish it were, but it's, it's not just about me. Uh, we have shows all throughout the day, all week, every day. Uh, even before the pandemic, even before this was going on, Adobe Live was your source for just hanging out with creatives all day long. So this uh, session early in the morning, depending on where you are, um, was added, added after the pandemic, just giving you more content to watch. So this is a getting started segment. This is, uh, you know, we have these from either 7.30 to, to 9 Pacific time or 8 to 9 Pacific time, depending on the day. But uh, today is 7.30 to 9, so that we'll be going for a full 90 minutes or 85 minutes to be exact. And um, after that, let me give you guys a quick look at the schedule. Today, it's a little bit different than yesterday, so we're going to kick things off with my segment, Be, Cre Be Creative on Mobile Part 2. Uh, then we're going to uh, hand it over to Kathleen. She's going to do the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge, which we do every day. It might be a different person doing it, but we do the challenge every single day where you get to learn something and take away something that you can go practice on on your own and then post the results to our Photoshop Discord channel. Uh, after that... Um, we're doing a special segment because NAB, which is the National Association of Broadcasters show, was canceled in Vegas for obvious reasons. Um, Jason Levine will be doing a virtual NAB. So that'll be hosted here on Adobe Live uh, at 9.30 uh, a.m. Pacific time. And just Jason will be bringing on different guests and talking about Premiere Pro and audio and, and After Effects. So if you're interested in our video solutions, that's your chance to hang out and hear from the professionals and um, learn all about video, learn about what the professionals do, and you can do it all from the comforts of your home. Then at 11.30, after Jason's done for a couple hours, he's going to be doing that, I believe, for the rest of the week, uh, at least through Thursday, I believe. Um, then we have the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge, which is also a, a new segment because we heard loud and clear that people love Photoshop, but they also love Illustrator. So uh, the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge will kick off with Julia at 11.30 Pacific time. And then she'll hand it off to um, uh, Aaron Nace, who will do Photoshop compositing. I believe this is also his part two today. And then we have an XD Daily Creative Challenge. So we have three Daily Creative Challenges every day uh, for Photoshop, Illustrator, and XD so that you can get a project to work on, go work on it on your own, and then post the results. Um, on on uh, the Discord channels for the various projects. 
Uh, Tim's saying there's 12 hours of streaming today, including the German, UK, and Australia stream. So yeah, lots of streaming, depending on where you are. And then uh, last but not least, uh, Paul Tranny kicked off a how to live stream yesterday. And he'll be continuing that today. So that's I'm sure that's hard for Paul to juggle live streaming while you're showing someone how to live stream and showing them all the gear and everything. That, that requires a lot of work, a lot of juggling. All right, so there's a lot to watch over on Behance.net slash live. Uh, that's where this will all be happening today. And again, uh, we're going to kick it off today with my part two on mobile. So yesterday we did... Um, I believe I did, I got the three apps. We did um, Capture, spent a lot of time in Capture. We kind of dug deep in Capture and showed every single module in Adobe Capture, which is a free app to download on both iOS and Android. Then I uh, showed the Creative Cloud app, which is also a free app to download for both iOS and Android. And the real major component there, aside from being able to access all your all your assets that you have in Creative Cloud, all your libraries, all your Lightroom photos, all that, uh, the biggest thing there was you also get to access the Adobe fonts because once you activate them in the Creative Cloud app, they then become available in Photoshop on the iPad. So I uh, did a couple quick demos in Photoshop on the iPad yesterday. So if you missed any of that, you can go watch that replay. Uh, just head over to behance.net slash live and scroll down. You'll be able to find the replay for uh, yesterday. So you can go ahead and catch up. Today, we're not going to be doing those apps. We're going to be doing different apps today. We're going to get into uh, a little bit of Lightroom because I cover Lightroom in depth on Fridays during my, photo, my photography masterclass. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time in Lightroom today because I do it every Friday. Um, but today, we're, we'll... we'll Take a little bit of a look at Lightroom. We'll also see a little video editing. We'll do some video editing with Premiere Rush. We'll um, take a look at, what else do I have on tap today? We'll take a look at uh, Spark Post. And we might even get a chance to look at something that's not necessarily a creative app, but it's extremely useful for everyone, whether you're using it for creative or not. Um, and I'm going to hold that one till, till I get to it. I'm not going to spoil that one until we get to it. All right, so uh, Thomas says, hi, I love, the, love what Adobe's doing with the, their live streams. The whole lineup is awesome. Thanks, Thomas. We're glad that you're here. And uh, Kirsty, um, hi, <laughs> smiley face, Kirsty. And Sean's laughing out loud at something. I don't know what. Um, but with that said, thanks, everyone. And by the way, if you're watching the replay and you hear me talking to people that you are like, who's he talking to? Those are the people that were live when I was doing this. Okay, <laughs> so... With that said, let's go ahead and dive in. I think I'm going to dive into Lightroom first just to get that out of the way. And then we'll uh, continue on with the other apps that I mentioned. So let's switch over to my um, <clears throat> switch over to my phone. Now, Lightroom is available on iOS, is available on Android, is available on iPad. It's available on lots of platforms. It's available on the desktop. It's available on the web, your laptop, so forth and so on. So Lightroom is kind of one of those apps. It got an early start on mobile, and it's only gotten better since then. And I remember I, I was one of the ones that complained internally to the, to the Lightroom team. This app just doesn't do enough. Why would I ever use it? And over the years, because it, it's been years, the Lightroom app has become indispensable for me as part of my photography. I use it all the time. So I can't imagine not having the Lightroom app after all this time. Um, and the features just kept getting better, 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 and better. All right, so where I'm going to start is not where you're probably thinking I'm going to start. You're probably thinking, I'm just going to open up a photo, probably one we've even seen before, and he's going to start editing that photo. No, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. We're going to start with the camera. We're going to start taking a photo. And I'm going to I have two different sets set up, two different mobile sets um, in my setup here. And we're going to just show how you can use it to take a picture and why you would use it to take your pictures as opposed to the, the camera app that's in your phone. Like you have, if you have an iPhone, you have a camera app. If you have an Android device, you have a camera app. Why would you even bother using the photo or the camera app in Lightroom? So let's, let's start with that. So I'm going to go ahead and launch Lightroom. 
and it just shows me my all photos view. It's showing me the 50,000 photos, 50,600 photos I've got synced to Lightroom. And um, <laughs> I'm bamboozled again. And then um, uh, I can go in, I can back out of that if I wanted to and go into the individual albums and learning and tutorials and so forth and so on. But no matter where I am, you'll notice that there is a camera button in the bottom right hand corner. There's also a, to the left of that button, there is an add photos button. So if you've already taken the picture with your camera app on your phone, no problem. Just add it in the Lightroom using that button on the bottom left or bottom right left button. <laughs> All right. If you want to shoot something, you walk up on a scene and you're ready to take the photo for the first time, that's where you get to make the choice. You can just you know, pop open your camera app. It's the fastest one to get to because there's hardware buttons for it. There's ways to get to it right on the lock screen. The camera app by, the, by default is going to be the one we all go to because it's the one we can get to the quickest. But if you're walking upon a scene that matters, something important, something just breathtaking, and you want to capture it in a great way, in a photographer type way, that's where the camera app comes in um, for, for um, photographers, for people that want, or not even photographers necessarily, but people that want to take a photo that's real, that matters. I'm just walking up and taking a selfie or shooting something I don't really care about. Doesn't matter what camera I use. But if it's a photographic scene or people that I want to photograph and I want to get the best possible quality, that's why I'm going to fire up the camera app. All right, so over to my right, I've got a scene over here. I'm going to go ahead and fire up the camera. And uh, my Star Trek fans in the audience will recognize this device, this prop. Uh, so this is the original... Star Trek communicator and the battery's dead, so it didn't make the sounds, but <laughs> this is the original Star Trek communicator from the series Star Trek back in the 60s where it started. And this is back, back in the days before cell phones. <laughs> this is what they used. And it was always amazing that the reception was perfect, even on another planet, even, no matter what. Transporters don't work. Nothing works, but the communicator always worked. We need that today. But anyway, uh, it's a little dusty. It's it's not perfectly clean. It's not in perfect condition, but it's here. So I'm gonna put this in my little light box here. I'm gonna lean it to the back so the, the antenna opens up there. And uh, I'll just walk you through kind of the different uh, options here that we have um, in the camera app. So I'm gonna go all the way back to the beginning. I'm gonna start with automatic. So automatic, just as the name implies, you you walk into a scene, you fire up the camera, you just hit you just hit the button, and you're saying, well, then Terry, why would I use this app if Automatic's just going to do what the standard camera app does? There's one major reason. If you look at the very top of my screen, um, besides the close and the flash, in the middle it says DNG. That stands for digital negative, and that means that if I shoot this or photograph this right now, it's going to capture it in RAW. So if I tap on that, I have the option to switch between RAW and JPEG. I use the DNG option 100% of the time, because if I just want a JPEG, I can go shoot with a regular camera. I don't need this camera for a JPEG. So I'm, I'm using this to capture the best possible photo that my uh, device can capture. So the 12 megapixel, full, uncompressed, unedited, un, un unanythinged <laughs> photo that my phone will support. So uh, I'll leave it on DNG. And then of course, in the upper right hand corner, you've got the toggle between selfie and, and the um, front camera. And then below that, there's the, there's kind of the magic that a lot of people overlook. There's three little dots below the, the, the camera switch uh, in the upper right hand corner. Those three little dots are actually a menu that turn on a lot of the power that's in the Lightroom camera that a lot of people just don't even know is there. So for example, um, let's see here. For uh, FYI, the RAW format is not available if you're using the ultra wide lens of the iPhone 11 Pro. You're absolutely right. So Tim pointed out a good, a good point, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but uh, I'm using an iPhone 11 Pro and it's got the three cameras. It's got the normal, the uh, telephoto, and the ultra wide. Well, the ultra wide is actually, a uh, little trivia for you. 
it's um, some technology that Apple built into the camera with software that makes that ultra wide shot. And that's not supported in RAW because we don't have access to get to that technology. So if they ever open that up, we can make that into RAW as well. Anyway, um, so this little menu I dropped down so I can uh, switch between aspect ratios, which is kind of nice. So if I'm shooting for a video, like I'm going to incorporate these shots in a video, then I would probably put it on 16 by 9. But 4x3 is the standard photo aspect ratio. Again, you can switch it to whatever you want. 1x1 one one would be square. 4x3 is pretty standard. 3x2 is, I don't know, 3x2 and then 16x9. All right, but I'm going to leave it on there. And then the other thing you're going to see me use in a few moments is the timer, which is kind of nice. You want to jump in the shot. You want to put your photo, your camera down, get in the shot, um, take in a group shot. Then you can set the timer, hit the shutter. You got up to 10 seconds to walk over and get in. All right, but this, this third one is one that I use a lot, and this is your grid and level. So I have the option of off. I have a four grid, and I have more the one I use the most, which is the rule of thirds. And for those of you who are unaware what that is, you see those, uh, here, I'll point it here so you can see it better. You see those white lines that are in the photo that's basically a, a grid of nine uh, rectangles? Well, what you're supposed to do composition-wise is you're supposed to put the most interesting parts of the photo that you're taking or the subject that you're taking in one of those intersections because that's just naturally the way our eye looks at something. We look at like we look from the left to the right to get to the scene. Or you want to draw people in or from the right to the left or from the top, bottom and up, down, whatever it is. So you put the interesting part of the photo um, in one of those intersections. In other words, we rarely put the subject dead center in the photo unless we're shooting a product shot or something like that. But if you're composing, that helps you with your composition. All right, uh, but besides that is a just another grid format that I don't use, but let's go to the one on the very end, which is also kind of nice, and it gives me a level. And it actually gives me a haptic feedback to let me know, like I feel a little vibration in my hand, when the camera is perfectly level, and I know it's not tilted, it's not crooked, it's not leaning forward, it's not leaning back, uh, it's perfectly level when it all lights up and when I feel it in my hand. So that way I know I'm taking a perfectly level shot when I do it that way. Very important when you're taking landscapes because uh, we hate crooked landscapes. We hate crooked horizon lines. And if you're gonna make it crooked, make it extremely crooked, do it on purpose, don't do it and make it look like it's slightly crooked, which means it's an accident. Okay, uh, so we use the level. Uh, what else? I think that was it for that section. I'm gonna turn the level off for now. And then this uh, next one is actually, this is like a pro feature, this highlight clipping. So this will show me um, if I take a photo and the highlights are blown out. So that means that the parts of the image are so bright that there's no detail in those areas of the photo whatsoever. So that's a very uh, nice option to have. And then you have a menu with more choices like maxing the screen brightness, which translates to kill my battery as fast as possible. <laughs> and you have the option to geotag your photos or if you're, you're in the privacy and you don't want that to happen, you can turn it off. And then you, uh, when you're taking um, HDRs or which we'll get into in a minute, you can save the uncompressed originals as well, which I don't do because I don't need them. All right, so that menu is right up there at the top right, and that lets you get to a lot of options that a lot of people overlook. Now, if we go down to the bottom, you have you have at least two modes. Um, I've got three. I'm sorry, you have at least, well, it depends on your camera. You have at least two to three of those modes. Um, I have automatic, professional, and high dynamic range. There's one mode missing. There's time lapse. Uh, not time lapse, um, long exposure is missing because it, apparently I don't have it turned on in my preferences because it's a technology preview. But you have the ability to just shoot automatic. That means if I snap that shot, here we'll do it now, boom, it will uh, just capture it and it'll auto adjust everything as best as possible. Now, if I uh, go to professional, which is kind of nice, I get control over my exposure compensation, my, um, my shutter speed, my ISO, my white balance, and my, um, I forgot what this is called, my, um, my, <laughs> um, I forgot what that one is. 
All right, someone will tell me in the chat. I forgot what that one is. I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on which that, because I, I don't really use it. I'm drawing a blank on it, but it looks like it's doing my... That could be... We already have shutter speed. I, I'm, I'm completely drawing a blank on that one. I forgot what it is. But anyway, there's another one that you can adjust. Um, and then at the very bottom on the right-hand side, we've got these changes between the different cameras. We've got telephoto, we've got the ultra-wide angle, and then we've got the wide angle. So the telephoto um, lets me do RAW, DNG at the top. The ultra-wide, you notice it switched automatically to a JPEG. I did not have a choice. Jim Bab Babbage um, popped in and said, that is my focus. So autofocus versus manual focus. Thank you, Jim. I always use the autofocus because usually I'm hand holding. All right, uh, and then the ultra, and then the wide, of course, lets me shoot in RAW or DNG as well. Then you have um, the ability to lock your exposure, which is the one on the right, and then you also have filters that you can shoot directly into um, a specific look that you would want as well. Uh, so I can shoot an, into a black and white look if I wanted to. What phone do you use for this lesson? This is an iPhone 11 um, Pro. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get out of Pro. I'm gonna go back to uh, my choices here. And I'm gonna switch to, uh, well, let me go Let me go to Pro. Let me go back to Pro for a second. Let's stay, stay with Pro. Let's get out of this. There we go. And let's go in, let's take a shot. Let's make some adjustments. So, um, when would I adjust any of this? Well, the shutter speed, for example, sometimes I'm taking pictures of, a, of another screen and you'll see that flicker that some of the older um, screens would have. So using my shutter speed, I'm able to adjust uh, and control the amount of, or how, how much shutter speed I'm gonna get for, um, for controlling what that's going to look like. Yell, Android is better, cough, cough. Send me yours, I'll use it. There we go. All right, <laughs> show me how much better it is. Send me one. All right, let's, uh, let's go on. So I'm going to go ahead and go back. And uh, next thing we're going to do is I'm going to... Um, one more tip for while we're in here, the exposure compensation. You can tap on it and you can, of course, drag it left or right. But one of the things that's already built in is exposure compensation is a shortcut. So if you wanted to just if you wanted to just adjust the exposure compensation, you can drag left or right. So what that says is I've got the photo dialed in on auto or my professional settings or whatever I want, and I can then just swipe left or right on the screen to make it a little brighter or make it a little darker if auto or the other settings aren't quite nailing it the way I want. Okay, so next up, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, grab a shot here. We will use the exposure compensation to brighten it up a little bit. And we'll shoot from the top down a little bit. And we'll, we'll take that shot. Okay, last but not least, HDR. High dynamic range. What this will do, and I typically will only handhold this if I'm shooting this tall or the telephoto or the wide angle. If I am, um, if I'm zoomed in a lot, like if I go beyond those and I zoom in even more, then it's pretty much impossible to hold it by hand and get a. <laughs> I started a, or, or Yale started a debate about which platform is better. Yale, if you prefer Android, I know you're feeling a little insecure about it. You can you can use your Android. It's okay. Anyway, we can go ahead and uh, uh, snap this HDR and it will do it. It will be, be just fine because I'm kind of holding it close. I'm steadying it on my leg. But typically an HDR is going to capture three frames at once. And if it captures three frames and you move a little, just a little between those three shots that it captures really quickly, it will be out of focus. So with that said, I would capture an HDR that's zoomed in on a tripod, on something that's going to steady it. So let's get out of the camera for a second. And those scenes will come in. And what I've got over here on my left is another photo setup 
but I'm going to use a, um, a monopod with a Archon mount for my phone holder. All right, so with that, I'm just going to go ahead and put the phone in it. And then we're going to go ahead and so we can see it. I'm going to go ahead and go to telephoto and telephoto. Oh, go back to telephoto, go back to telephoto and go back to telephoto. If I stop tapping, that will give me a shot, but it's not going to give me the one that I want that would be zoomed in enough. So now I'm just going to go ahead and pinch and zoom. You can go in further than what the camera is set up for by default. And you can get your scene that way. So I've got a couple of uh, uh, toys over there. Um, uh, one is, is uh, they're di diverse toys. So we have some, a person that's in a wheelchair. We have a person that's just standing there behind her. And uh, I just want to capture the scene. They're also in a light box. I've got a couple of lights on either side to light it. But if I were to try and handhold that and shoot it, it would be out of focus. How do I know? Because I've tried it. It's just not enough. And that is going to use the digital zoom. That's correct. Now, even tapping it could make it out of focus because the camera is going to vibrate when I tap the shutter, when I press on the sides, when I do anything, that's also going to make it out of focus. So I said we'd go to this and, and come back to it. We're going to do it right now. We're going to go up to that menu again, and we're going to go to the timer. I'm going to set the timer to five seconds. And now it's even giving me the shutter, the shutter button says five on it, letting me know that if I tap now, uh, I got five seconds to kind of just back off and let it stabilize. So let's go ahead and do that. Well, and I already shook it just by hitting it by accident. Let's go ahead and tap it now. And now I got five seconds before it actually snaps it for the camera to settle down. And that captured three frames as fast as the hardware would allow to make that into an HDR. For those of you who are like, what's high dynamic range? What's HDR mean? It means that um, it's capturing three different exposures at once. So it's capturing uh, kind of exposure in the middle, it's capturing, capturing one that's overexposed to capture the shadow details, and it's capturing one that's underexposed um, to capture the highlight details. So it's putting those all three together in the background to make that HDR shot, that high dynamic range shot. So if you ever tried to photograph uh, something that was hard, like you're hard to photograph, you're photographing a person standing in front of a bright window. And usually we, we want the person exposed and we don't care about the window. We let the window get blown out. But if you're trying to capture that scene where maybe the person is standing in front of a brightly lit background that you also want, that's where HDR comes in. So you would be able to capture the exposure of the person and the brightly lit background behind that person and the HDR will put those three images together so that all of it's exposed properly. And if not, you also have the ability to go in and adjust it after the fact. So I'm going to take one more of these since I've got it set up there. We'll tap. We'll let it count down to five, four, three, two, one, one, and boom, it snapped it again with no movement whatsoever. I can still tap to focus, by the way. Let me do that one more time. And now that it focused on her, here we go. And now I can go ahead and take it out of the tripod. So I'm just going to go ahead. And by the way, that's that was the tripod there for a second. Now, we don't see the shots right away. They're starting to come in because Lightroom doesn't start processing the HDRs until you're not shooting anymore. So the camera, the, the app needs to stay open. And then you'll see the icon in the upper right corner on the cloud. It will actually have a different symbol on it while it's processing um, those, those, um, those shots. So um, I mentioned the long exposure one. I said it was a technology preview. I have that apparently turned off. So I'm going to go here in my settings, technology preview. And you've got two more. You've got uh, long exposure, which I'm going to turn on, and depth map support, which I'm also going to turn on. Okay, so now that I've got those on, I can go back out, get out of that. And now if I were to go to the camera one more time and go, I have those two different options to choose. So I've got the long exposure option, which it does a trick. It's not really like on a regular DSLR where it's holding the shutter open. It's um, capturing a bunch of frames like an HDR, but it's capturing a ton more 
and putting them together. So if you're trying to shoot that silky waterfall look where the water looks like it's misty, but you're only using your phone, you could use that long exposure feature to kind of fake that look. And depth capture, um, which will also create a depth map, is great when you're using Photoshop to, um, with the lens blur, to change the, the depth of field, to change the focus point. Uh, so that's your two extra options, which are technology previews. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get out of those now. Now I'll turn them back on. And uh, we'll go back to the shots we just took. And we'll go in and we'll, uh, we'll take that last one that we just photographed. And it's um, looking at the focus. The focus looks good. There are a few things I would go ahead and adjust with this photo. So again, captured it as an original DNG. So it's a raw file. It will sync it or has already synced it to the cloud. So if I were to go to Lightroom on any of my other devices now, those raw images would be there and ready to go. Any adjustments I make here are made to the metadata and are non-destructive. So that's one of the biggest advantages of not only um, working in Lightroom, but working with Lightroom anywhere you are in, on any device, because all the changes you make are just metadata changes that are non-destructive. All right, so with that said, uh, what would I do here? So first thing I like to do is just let, let Lightroom have a crack at it using the, um, the auto tone feature, which is Adobe Sensei enabled. So I would just tap auto and I either like it or I don't. And usually I don't like parts of it. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and make my own adjustments after that. I also make sure that it's done. It usually does it by default, um, that it's also enabled the lens correction, which it's done that for my phone. Great. And um, I can adjust the color. Right now the white balance is as shot. And because it was shot in raw, I get to pick my different um, white balance settings. So uh, I can use any of the ones that are here. I could use auto, I could use daylight, cloudy, whatever. If I use auto, that's still a little warm for me. So I'm gonna use the white balance eyedropper, just like I would in the studio, and sample uh, that background, which is kind of grayish white. All right, so that's, well, it's gray because of the lighting, but it should be white. All right, so that'll give me a custom white balance to adjust the color, the overall temperature of the photo. Now, if I go to light, these are all the things that light did when I hit auto. But again, some of those I may not agree with. So, for example, it lowered the exposure. That's one that I don't agree with. Uh, so I would go ahead and brighten the exposure. I don't think it should be lower. I think it should be a little brighter. Um, you can argue with the AI. It's OK. You can argue with Adobe Sensei and say, no, no, no. I prefer it this way and change it. Uh, but it gave me a good starting point for everything else. Everything else I do pretty much agree with. So let's go ahead and um, let's do a couple more here. Let's go to effects. And because we, uh, or actually what I want to go to is detail. Because this was a smartphone with not optimal lighting, without not optimal conditions, you typically are going to get some noise, some grain in your photos if they're a little dark. So I love uh, Lightroom's noise reduction under detail. So it applied a little bit. I'm going to apply a little bit more. And you can always zoom, pinch and zoom in to see what that's going to look like. And I like the noise reduction that I applied there. All right. And um, again, this is all happening uh, in real time on my phone. But it's also every time I uh, make a change, it's remembering that change. Then when I get out of editing this photo, it will sync those changes back up to the cloud. OK, uh, next up, there's a little speck of something right there. It looks like a specular highlight on the background because there's a fold in it. Well, I, I don't like that. It looks like a it's a distraction. So I want to remove that. So in this case, I'm going to go to the healing brush. And I'm just going to go ahead and paint with my finger. And it will allow me to remove that spot. Uh, again, non-destructively. And I can just go ahead and heal that out of it. There we are. Cool. Everything else I'm happy with. And at this point, if I back out of editing, now I see the cloud icon in the upper right hand corner, which is starting to pulsate, letting me know I'm syncing those changes you just made up to the cloud. And now I'm done. Looks like it's done. Yes, it's done. OK, let's go back to the um, to the communicator. So a couple things with the communicator shot. Um, I, again, I'm not happy with the, the it's a little too bright, in my opinion. And also, I don't like seeing the sides of the box there, so I would probably crop it. 
And let's go ahead and do those things right, real quick. So I go to crop first and you can crop it to a specific aspect ratio if you want. So for example, if I were gonna put this on um, Instagram, Instagram is a four by five, eight by 10 aspect ratio. So I'd wanna keep the portrait part of that intact, but I can go ahead and move that around. I can move the image around in the crop. I can maybe put it over there and crop down to it, something like that. And no matter what, it's keeping that four by five aspect ratio. Um, I need a good phone with a good lens. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how many people are just using their phones these days for photography because the phones have gotten really, really, really good. Even the Android ones. That was for you, yo. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, hit OK on that. And now we can go ahead and do the rest. So again, I know it applied the lens correction. Um, it applied a few things automatically, but I'm going to go ahead and do that auto toning. That did bring down that exposure a bit. I already saw the black get a little blacker. Um, and that's exactly what I wanted. I still will go into the lighting and adjust and, and, and tweak it to my heart's content. It brought the exposure down. I can maybe play with the exposure a little bit more. Nope, it actually brought it down to a good spot. And I can maybe make the blacks even blacker because like I said, that communicator did have like a little, what looked like dust on it. Even though I wiped it, it still had like a dust look and feel to it. Now, because this is not a person, I tend to go in with um, the color settings and go a little bit more than I would on a person. So I would, for example, uh, maybe adjust the vibrance to bring some of that gold out of the antenna, adjust the saturation as well to bring out the colors in those buttons, the green, red, and blue, um, and just go ahead and, and adjust those as well. Uh, the temperature, I can manually adjust it or I can use a slider. It was about right maybe make it a little warmer there. And that gives me that shot ready to go. All right, and once I back out of it, that shot will be uh, adjusted as well. Now I adjust it too. I didn't adjust everything because it would just be more of the same. But on this one, I wanna say this is my favorite of these two. And on the other one, I want to adjust and say this is my favorite of the, of the two, of the three. So in this case, I'm gonna go from edit to rate and review. So rate and review, matter of fact, you have different modes to go in. You have edit, rate and review, activity, keywords, and, and um, info. So while I'm in rate and review, I'm gonna go ahead and say, this is a pick, it's one of my favorites, and let's go ahead and give it a five-star rating. And then we'll swipe over to the one we adjusted here, same thing, pick, and five-star rating. Now I'm going ahead and doing it right there on the icons, but you have a speed review mode as well. On the left side of the photo, if you swipe up or down, you're adjusting the number of stars. So you see where my finger is dragging up and down? It's adjusting the stars all the way from zero to five stars. If I go to the right side of the photo, you're adjusting reject, nothing, pick. So you can adjust uh, quickly by just swiping, dragging, swipe, drag, without having to tap on the icons if you choose to. All right. Um... Yeah, that's it. All right. Now, next thing I'll do is I'll do one more thing. I'll put those two in a in an album. So let's go ahead and select that photo and that photo. And we will add them. Add to at the very bottom. Uh, we'll go to demo and we'll go to um, we'll go to a mobile demo. We'll add them there. So now if I were to get out of my all photo view and I were go to demo and I will go to a mobile demo, I will see all of those photos plus the two I just added at the bottom. So everything I've ever, ever, ever added to that album will be there. So that way they're also uh, available to me uh, in those same albums in Lightroom, obviously. But a lot of things that you're using your mobile devices for, like Photoshop, or not Photoshop, it would be a good example. Um, Spark, for example, when you say use a photo from Lightroom, Spark doesn't see all photos. It only sees the albums. So if there are specific photos you want to use in other applications, it's better to organize them into an album so that you'll be able to access them when you get to those other apps. So by putting those two in my 
Adobe Mobile or a mobile um, demo, and I put the A in there so it'll be at the top, <laughs> but a mobile demo uh, album, that means that it will um, be visible to my other apps when I go to use it. All right, let's see here. I'm going to switch gears quickly. Let's do this. And let me just launch something here real quick. I just want to point out something. Let's get it launched on the desktop first. And let's get to the right spot. All right, we'll go back to the desktop now. And my desktop is letting me know, hey, there's a new version of Lightroom desktop. I know that I got the mobile version yesterday, but I did not get the, uh, the desktop version. And what's happening in the upper right-hand corner is the sync icon is now downloading uh, those images that I just added and shot. So it's downloading all the images, it's putting everything in all photos, and ultimately it should put those two uh, here in the um, in the album as well. Let me also launch it on my iPad. Go to the right spot. And if I switch back to the iPad, um, they're already there on the iPad. So here are the two shots we just added. That one and that one. Complete with all the edits and complete with everything that we would also still be able to adjust. And uh, we'll let that happen in the background on the desktop as well. All right, so that's what I meant by working in Lightroom. Your images are everywhere you have Lightroom, including the web. So if I were to go to lightroom.adobe.com, those two images would be there as well. And by the way, I just saw them pop in on the desktop. So there they are on the desktop version of Lightroom. And they're even in Lightroom Classic. If I were to launch Lightroom Classic, they would be um, in the same collection and in the same uh, all photos view in Lightroom Classic as well, as long as you have Lightroom turned on the sync. And the difference is Lightroom Classic would sync down the whole 12 megapixel raw file, not just the smart preview. It syncs um, full version down, full resolution down, smart previews up. Lightroom uh, Cloud version syncs both full resolution up and down, and of course, iPad and, um, and phones support uh, both up and down as well. Okay, so that was a quick review and quick view of using Lightroom. All your editing capabilities, all non-destructive, and the ability to continue the editing anywhere and using those photos anywhere. The two dogs remind me of Robot Chicken. Okay, uh, good to know, Steve. All right, next up, let's go to our next app while we've got plenty of time. I took a little more time on Lightroom than I wanted to. That's why I wanted to get it out of the way so that I would have more time for the next thing we're going to do. All right, so let's, um, let's go to the iPad. And here I am in my Adobe folder on my iPad. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to... Um, I'm going to go into something that many of you are afraid of for some reason, but I'm going to show you just how, why you shouldn't be afraid of it. Every device we mention, even the Android ones, every device we mention is uh, capable of shooting video. Just about everything shoots video. Your tablet shoot video. Your phone shoot video. Uh, everything shoots video. So why not take advantage of those videos that everything you have can shoot video? Your DSLR, your mirrorless camera, your iPad, your iPhone, your Android device, uh, your computer can record video. Like everything can record videos and shoot videos. So wouldn't it be cool if you could actually polish those videos up a little bit? I don't mean become like a, a master video editor. I don't mean change your career, unless that's what you want to do. I mean just with an easy, quick tool make your video just a little bit better before you post it. That's all. Add a title, add a couple transitions, add some music, whatever it is, but quickly and easily. Now, I love Premiere Pro on the desktop. I use Premiere Pro on the desktop all the time. However, I've become a recent fan of Premiere Rush because it's on mobile. Now, does Premiere Rush do everything that Pr Premiere Pro does on the desktop? Absolutely not, not even close. Just like Photoshop on the iPad doesn't do everything yet. 
that Photoshop on the desktop does. And just like Lightroom doesn't do everything yet that Lightroom Classic does on a desktop. But if they do enough for the kinds of things that I want to do when I'm mobile, that makes it worth using. All right, so everybody's like, yeah, yeah Rush, love Rush. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, launch Rush, Premiere Rush. And these are projects that I've worked on in the past. We're going to create a new project at the very bottom. So I'm just going to tap the plus sign at the very bottom, create a new project, and it wants me to either do one of two things. Go get some assets to add. They could be stills. They could be videos. They could be both. Or hold up my device and start shooting the video right now. And just like um, Lightroom has a better camera with more features than the one that's built into your device, same thing with Rush. The Rush camera for shooting video gives you more choices than the camera app on your device for shooting video. So just keep that in mind. I'm not going to go through them all here because we're going to run out of time. But just know that you have a very good video um, camera in Rush as well. So I'm going to go ahead and say Add Media because I've already shot videos that I want to use. And it's going to ask me where to get those videos from. And I can start to see the uh, some of the shots we took. I'm going to go to my albums. These are my albums on my iPad. So these are in the Photos app uh, on my iPad. I'm going to scroll all the way down to my Iceland videos uh, from my last trip to Iceland, which was now a couple years ago. Um, Adobe Comp. Yeah, I, I see people mentioning Comp. Comp. I'm a fan of Comp. I've done Comp many times. Uh, I don't think we'll get to Comp today, but Comp is a great layout tool for creating uh, layouts, and maybe we'll maybe we'll get to it really quick because um, I love Comp. But anyway, we'll see. I, I don't like going off script, but we'll see. Maybe I'll get to it. All right. So here are a bunch of videos uh, clips from Iceland. I have many more, but these are some of the my, some of my favorite clips to tell kind of the story of just my my jaunt through uh, Iceland. So I'm gonna, um, it's actually asking me which ones of these do I want and also to give it a title. So I'm going to give it the title first because I always forget. Iceland um, Live. All right, we'll call it Iceland Live. All right. Now it's asking me uh, which photos or which photos or videos do I want. So I can pick them in order. What's nice about this is I'm telling it I want that video first, I want that video second, I want that video third, I want that video fourth, I want that video fifth, um, so forth and so on. And then I want this video next, and then this video, and then this video, and then this video. Why, are my, why does it matter what order I pick them in? Because if you pick them in the order you kind of want them laid out in, and you want the video to tell your story in, then it will do that part of the work for you right off the bat. So I can say, go ahead and create. And it'll process that media, meaning put it all together. Um, yes, I'm using Rush on the iPad. Oh, you're asking Alberto. And there's my video, and you're seeing just a preview of it. So let me switch so we can see both the interview and the preview. There we go. Uh, or the interface and the preview. And now, if I didn't do anything else, I've edited a video just by putting the clips together and saying, go. So I could hit play right now just to test it. And that will show me uh, my video as it's uh, zooming out. And of course, this is drone footage. Uh, so just launching the drone and going straight up with it. And um, here's the, the one tip I'll give you about editing video. Shorter is always better. Tell the story, but don't have people look at something longer than they need to look at to get the point. So this is a drone flying around the convention center. It's flying around the convention center for a really long time. <laughs> In other words, we get it. You flew around the convention center. Oh, there's the back of the convention center. Oh, great. Here comes, guess what? Here comes the other side of the convention center. Oh, wow. We're going to see the other side now. Wonderful. Oh, look at all the glass. Great. This is fantastic. Woohoo. Love it. Oh, we're still looking at the convention center. It's still going. You still haven't gone on to the next scene. You still haven't gone on to the next thing. Wow, you're flying around the convention center again. You're starting another pass around it. You get my point. Don't don't drag it out. Don't make it any longer than this. So that clip is way longer than it needs to be. 
Um, and <laughs> wow, more convention center. Yep, going around for a second pass in case I didn't get it the first time. Okay, and then here comes a waterfall. Did I really need to start the video from way up in the sky? You kind of need to see maybe the sky to get some, uh, get just from a composition standpoint. And then guess what? Water hits the bottom. And then water's still hitting the bottom. Yep, water's still hitting the bottom. Water's still hitting the bottom. Yeah, wow. Oh, there's paths down there. Oh, oh, here comes another waterfall. Great. So we're going to stop here. You get the idea. And I just, I, I wanted to make that point because what may not seem like it's a long time when you're shooting it or when you're, even when you're looking at it, is an eternity when you're looking at it for, or when you're sharing it with someone who maybe isn't as passionate about it. They weren't there. They don't really care that the waterfall was going for another five minutes. So make it shorter. Cut. That's why, that's why we're in this tool. So we can cut this down and make this a lot shorter and tell a faster story because um, I'm the worst offender of making videos longer probably than they should be. All my tutorials, people you know, usually say, oh, I love your tutorial, wish it was shorter, wish you were blah, blah, blah. I, I, I get it. Um, but when you're telling this kind of story where you're not teaching something, you're just kind of showing what happened, shorter is way better. So with that said, if you're going to be creative with video, if you're going to be creative, and again, you don't have to have a drone, you don't have to shoot perfect. You do want to shoot steady, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, get the point across as quickly as, as you can. If a video is five minutes, can you make it two? If it's two minutes, can you make it one? If it's one minute, can you make it 45 seconds? Because when people see your video, when you share the link and they see how long it is, they decide right then and there if they're going to watch it or not. If it says two minutes, okay, I got two minutes, I'll watch it. If it said 20 minutes, I'll come back to it later. And later never happens. So just keep that in mind. Now, later could happen or they could do it right then and there if it's compelling enough. If it's they're like they're going to learn the secrets of curing something, <laughs> then they're going to watch the whole thing or watch as much of it as they have to. But if it's just a, hey, look at my vacation video from Iceland, 20 minutes. Oh, yeah, OK. Hmm. Probably not going to watch that. A minute and 30 seconds? Oh, yeah, that's cool. Let me see the quick recap of the video. So just keep that in mind. All right, um, so let's start at the very beginning. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to pinch and zoom this out a little bit so I can see more of it. I'm not making it longer. I'm just expanding the width of the, of the timeline itself. The video is still the same amount of video that it was. All right, so the drone starts on the ground, obviously, and starts flying up. And there's a person down there in the left-hand corner that was just standing there. Or maybe that's it's not me. That's somebody else. And then it gets to this point to where there's nobody in the way. So I've cut off, looks like seven seconds right there by, by not having to show it. We get it. It's, it. It probably took off from the ground. Do we really need to see it from the ground up? We get the idea. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the scissors. And just tap the scissors and make the cut right then and there. Then I can tap and hold or yeah, hold on that clip and say delete. Okay, so now we're starting from here. And we just took off seven seconds right off the bat. So you, it should be a game for you. How, how much can I make this shorter? Can I, how much time can I cut off this clip? Because then it makes it more fun when you're doing that. Um, all right, so... <laughs> Long story short. All right, so now we, we scrub through it and we get it. We get the idea. And now it's just going to hit water. It's going to stay on water for another few seconds. So I would say that I probably start from here, go up to maybe here. And that's enough because all I'm going to use this for is a title anyway. I'm just going to put some text over the top of this. And the text doesn't need to be any longer than that. So grab our scissors once again. And we make our cut. Now, you can also pull the sides in. You can trim that way. Uh, it, all of it's non-destructive. It doesn't matter which way you do it. So I'm going to hold down there and then delete that part. Okay. So now I've just already automatically made that part of the video shorter. And we're going to now go ahead and add our title while we're thinking about it. So uh, what's next? Over on the right-hand side, I see a T for title. And I see... Um, I see my styles, which these are the ones that come with Premiere Rush. Um, and, and some of these may be ones that I've already downloaded from Adobe Stock. 
So style, for example, um, the one that says style next to motion title, that's one that I downloaded from Adobe Stock because I liked it. So if you if you don't see a title you like, if you don't see a, a thing that you want to use, then you can tap more titles and you can grab any of these from Adobe Stock. There's like 20 pages of them right here. And there's style, the one I already grabbed. Um, and any one that you see that you like, let's say, I'm not going to use it, but let's say I like brush title. I can tap on brush title and then it puts brush title there. And if I were to hit play, uh, this is what the brush title looks like. So it's already downloaded. It's already part of my, my styles. And if I wanted to use that brush title, I could, I, I don't want to use that brush title, but I could. All right. So let's, and it's too long anyway. So let's go ahead and delete that title. I don't want that one. But I just wanted to show you how you can get more titles. And there's pages and pages and pages of titles. Uh, lower thirds, which is the stuff underneath you that says your name or whatever you want to say, the name of the project. Uh, all kinds of titles in here. Some are animated, some are static. Um, some are different themed, like Happy Holidays. Uh, let's grab that one. I just want to see what it does. Let's go to the Happy Holidays one. I just want to see what it looks like, see if it's animated. All right, and play it. And yeah, it's animated. It's got some snow. The text is animated. And then it just keeps flashing. And then it'll eventually fade out when it gets to the end. And it fades out and disappears. Okay, so like I said, some of the titles you get will be animated. Some aren't. Um, unfortunately, I don't think they made it yet. So you can tell at a glance which ones are animated or not. But they are. They are there. All right, so I'm going to go back to my styles because I like the ones that are already downloaded. And I'm going to go to style. I just like this, this, this title. Ooh, and it's nice and short. Okay. If it wasn't short enough, by the way, you can just condense the sides of it. You can make it shorter and it will keep the animation. It will do the right thing. So a long title that needs to be short, just drag it in and it will still keep the animation. It will just go faster. All right. So now if we got, if we scroll up past this, we see the word style. And I now on the right hand side on the edit, I can go edit what it actually says. So let's say that I, or by the way, I don't have to, I don't have to do it on the right hand side. I can also double tap right on the text and I can just say, um, Iceland and there we go. And so now if I don't do anything else, if I were to play that, there's my Iceland title. It goes away and then it goes to the next scene. Okay, now we're flying around the convention center. Do I need to see it from that angle? No, 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 I don't need to see that. I can probably stop here and now stop here. And now I'm going to go back a little bit and I'm going to trim it from here. So I'm just going to grab this side instead of using the scissors. Maybe I won't. All right, it's being difficult. All right, I will use the scissors. It's being difficult with me grabbing it in that spot. I'm just trying to get the right spot where I want it. Right there. Scissors. Cut. Delete. And then we, we scrub past it. And we go to the back of it maybe. And that's it. That's all we need. We don't need any more. Cut it. Get rid of all of this after it. Delete. All right. Then we jump to a waterfall. We just made that so much shorter, so much better. And then we jump to this. Okay, same thing here. I don't need to see it from there. Maybe I want to start it right about there. So same thing, scissors, cut it, delete the part on the front that I don't want. And then we go down, it gets to the bottom and boom, there's water hitting the bottom. That's it, don't need any more after that. You get the idea, it's a waterfall. Get rid of this part, all the stuff at the end. Oh, there was another waterfall there. Let me undo that. There was another waterfall there. That was all one clip. So let me get past this to the other waterfall, which I'm kind of like the drones kind of going left to right. I don't really want that. Um, and then there are people up there. I kind of like showing the people aspect of it. So I'm going to go for maybe right here. So we'll grab our scissors. And let's see, what did I do there? Did I cut it? I think I did. No, I did. Oh, I didn't have it selected. Okay, so now I have it selected. So we go, we don't need any of that. We don't need any of that. We just want to start from right, right there. 
All right, now we'll grab our scissors, makes that cut. Then I don't need any of this stuff up front. So now we have our two waterfall shots going from that one, boom, to that one, and then we go to our trees. And the trees are already pretty short, but can they be shorter? Yes, they can. Because we don't need that part in the beginning where we see the road, maybe right there. And we cut that and get rid of that part. And then we also don't need this part at the end. Kind of where the, the drone kind of stops and just hovers there. We're good. I know it's trees. We don't need that part at the end. Again, your, your question should always be, can it be shorter? So you get the idea. You, you can just keep going and um, making cuts and trims where you need to. Now, there are some things that I just want to point out because the rest of this would be the same thing. Just keep continuing to cut it down and continuing to um, to make it shorter. But you, you already got that idea. So let's let's talk about some of the other things we can do. So maybe right here where the water's really, where it gets dramatic and the water's starting to hit the bottom, maybe I want to slow that part down because that's interesting, seeing how the water hits the bottom. So in that case, now I may want to add some speed to it. So we have a new speed ramp, uh, the little, um, speedometer on the right hand side so i'm going to go ahead and tap it and that gives me the ability for the entire clip to control where it starts and where it stops so again i don't care about it at the beginning i don't care about it until we get to right here that's where i want to slow it down so i'm going to tap the um the icon in the upper left and drag it over to that spot because that's where I want the speed, either speed up or slow down to happen. Uh, did I shoot this with the DJI Mavic 2? No, the Mavic 2 wasn't out when I went, I went there. This was all shot with the Mavic Pro, uh, the first Mavic Pro, not the, not the new one. All right, so now that I've narrowed it down to just the part that I want to speed up, and also let me let me get to the end here. So I want to or slow it down. Yeah, slow it down to the end. So now that I, I have that area selected, I can now go over to the right-hand side and choose, do I want to make it slower or do I want to make it faster? You can drag it e in either direction. So we can make it slow down at that point and also just so it doesn't go from normal to slow and then jump to the next clip, I want to ramp it. So I want it to ramp to a slow down and then ramp back up to normal shot. Uh, yes, I did shoot all of this. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, tap the ramp button, and now let's play it. So uh, we see our waterfall coming down, waterfall coming down, and then, boom, it slows down. Nice and slow, nice and dramatic, and then it won't speed back up. It'll just go to the next clip. It just goes to the next clip. So you could do that any way you want. You could pull the paddles in, the handles in, so that it does speed back up before it goes out, or you could just have it slow down and then go out to the next clip. All right, so that's uh, that's one of the advantages here is that you can speed up and slow down clips very easily. Now, what if you wanted to, for whatever reason, speed up a clip, go back to normal, and then speed it up again? Can I do it that way? No, not directly. Because you can only speed up or slow down an entire clip. So if I wanted to, let's go to another clip I'll show you. Let's say I wanted to go here. And I want, like, like there's a bird flying by. We can barely see it because it flies by so fast. There it is. Let's say I want to slow down that bird. But I also want to speed up this part. So that's two different things that I want to do. So what I want to do is I want to say, uh, let's get out of speed for a second. I just want to show this. Let's get out of out, no, out of speed, out of speed, out of out of that. Okay, let's say that I want to uh, get to the spot where the bird flies over, slow it down so we can see the bird because it flies by so fast, and then uh, slow it. Okay, here's a good example. Slow it down again where we see the bird. So we're basically where we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna say after the bird flies by the first time. There's the bird flying by the first time right there. We're gonna cut it cut we're not deleting anything we're just making a cut we're saying i want to make this two clips because now that it's two clips i can put a speed on each one 
wherever I want. So now on this first clip, we did, again, it, it will play the same. It does not change. On this first one, did I cut it in the right spot? Yeah, I did. So on this first one, we're going to slow it down. We're going to go back to speed. And now we're going to say, no, I don't need you to slow it down until we get to the bird. Until we get to the bird is like towards the very end. Right there. Yeah, we don't really, we really don't need to slow it down to the very end. So I'm just pinching out to zoom out so I can see more of it. And then I can move the paddles in to maybe right there. That's where it comes out. And then it goes away. Okay. So now I want to slow that down so we'll actually be able to see it. And slow down just that piece of it and ramp it. So same thing here, we'll hit play. Bird slows down so we can see it. And I can slow it down more, but you get the idea. And then it goes to the next clip where I don't need to slow it down again until we get to the bird again, right there. So let's go back out. We can pinch this back down, by the way. There we go. Go back out and there goes the bird again. So I'll bring the paddles over to that spot, and the bird flies by right there. It flew by really quick. Let's say that's all I needed, and we'll just now bring the other paddle in, because we only need to slow down just that section. So now we'll slow that section way down, and then we get this, and we'll ramp it. There we go. Play. Ah, oh, it flew by twice. There we go. It flew, it's flying around the drone, by the way. It's like, you're invading my airspace. I'm going to attack you. <laughs> so that's why we're seeing this bird constantly circle the drone. Did I capture too much of it, or does it fly around again? I think it flies around again. So this will be another example where I'd probably cut this. I'd make a cut and speed it, slow it down in two different places instead of this middle part being slow just to get the bird coming around again that I don't need. So that's an ex another example of why I want to split this into two clips. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and say cut it. And then we can um, get our bird flying around right there. Pull this in. Uh, hang on, let's... I may have, I should probably shouldn't have cut it while it was still there. Or is it? Ah, okay, I was pulling in both sides. There we go. So we want from there to perhaps there. All right. And then speed back up again. And then somewhere in there is another, or maybe it's on this one. There's another bird there that I would need to slow down and speed up. But you get the idea. So just keep cut your clips up first. That way you get the idea of speeding up and slowing down just the parts you need. All right, let's do one more thing before we uh, end Rush and we'll go on to our next app. Um, this is all silent. You're not hearing anything, not because I turned the audio off, because with drones, there is no audio. There is no microphone on the drone. There's, it's not capturing any sound. So that's why you're not hearing anything. Uh, now, you can uh, go back to your plus sign. You can add your own voiceover so you can talk through it as well. You can add more media. So if you have your own soundtrack, you can go ahead and add your own sound. Uh, and you can, of course, add titles and capture more footage. But I'm going to go ahead and add media. And I do have my own sounds, but luckily, the Rush soundtracks have also been expanded. I think when Rush first came out, there was like maybe 10 or 12 or 9, some low, low number. 
Uh, but now there's tons more. So there's literally a bunch more to choose from. Not hundreds, but you know, more than 10. So uh, if you wanted to hear it first, and I'd have to hear my, put in my earbuds so I can hear what you're hearing. So let me do that. If I wanted to hear it first, then I can uh, just play it. Oh, I have it muted. I'm like, why am I not here? There it is. I've used this sound before. It's okay. Uh, here's another one. Might make a good background track for this. But I think there was one down here that I liked. Oh, I don't remember the name of it. Let's see. Dun, 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 dun. Let's try knockout. I've used that before too. It's not bad. Going up. How about in the moment? Nah. These are all good, but not what I want. World Traveler. Let's see what that is. We'll use echoes all right so i'll go ahead and play apply echoes it brings it in and it puts it as a soundtrack automatically now it's only as long as it is so it's not long enough um but then again i'm also not finished editing so you have a choice of either duplicating the track Finding another track. Yes, those are free free tracks to use. Um, question I saw there, they're royalty free for you to use. Um, so my choices would be make the video small, shorter, which I'm still working on. So I'd still probably shorten it down to fit that. I could start it over again. I could certainly duplicate it and add it again. Um, I could go find another longer track that's royalty free for me to use. YouTube has a royalty free library for you to use, by the way. Um, you have, so those are pretty much your choices <laughs> or find a longer track in, in, in Premiere Rush. Uh, so now if I were to go back and play this, this is what, what it would play like and sound like. With what we've done to it so far. And that's even still too long. Look at how long that is. I cut it down some more or speed up the clip. Maybe not cut it down, but speed it up. It's just taking too long to go around. Hey, there's our waterfall. That should slow down now. When it hits the bottom, then it jumps to the next one. That could be cut from that point forward. So when you play it back, you'll find more places to cut. You'll find more things to speed up. And we haven't done this one yet, so that one's just going to be long. So like on this one, I'd still go to speed and I'd say, well, maybe I don't want to cut it, but it certainly does need to play that slowly. Let's maybe drop that in half and then play it. Now that probably don't need to ramp that one, but let's just by cutting that in half, the drone will fly around it quicker because we sped it up, but it's not overly fast. It's not too fast, it's, it's about what you'd want. You're just trying to give that look of the building. I could probably even speed it up a little bit more. So just keep in mind, shorter is better. Find ways to cut off things you don't need. Um, yeah, the sound is very low in the background on purpose. I turned it down for the stream software. Otherwise it'd be blaring in your ears and you wouldn't even be able to hear me. But yeah, so the music's there and it's normally way louder than that. I have it turned down. Uh, so that's why you're not hearing it very loud. Next up, let's get out of Premiere. Oh, so if we were finished, we could always go home, by the way, and work on it later. It will save it, and it will, if you told it to, it will sync it so that you could use Premiere Rush on the desktop to finish it. You also have the ability to go in and um, share it. So if I go back to it, and we go back to this. Yes. 
I have the ability to share it, which I hate that share is grayed out. Share should not be grayed out because it makes it look like you can't do it. But if you share it, you have the ability to export it directly to your device or directly to social media. So you can um, export it directly to Facebook or export it directly to Instagram, TikTok, um, and Behance. Using the export capabilities there. Hang on. And now if I were to export, it would render it. All right, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to cancel. But that would render it out. No, cancel. That would render it out, in this case, to my device. And then I would have a video ready to share any way I wanted to. Upload it to YouTube. Upload it wherever I wanted to upload it. Okay. Next up. We have about 10 minutes left. Let's get to another app. So hopefully you got something out of Premiere. Um, since we are talking about being creative, let me see if I can get this going here real quick. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Adobe Comp, someone asked about it earlier. So because you asked, because I'm paying attention to the live chat, let's close this and let's just talk about Comp really quickly and what you could do with it. So Comp, think about it as a layout tool on your phone, on your tablet. Uh, I believe it is on Android as well. It was definitely on iPhone and iPad. So I've got some layouts here that are ready to go, but I, or that I've done in the past, but I can just go ahead and tap. Uh, I can get a page or, or social media size that I want. So if I'm trying to make something for social media, social's there. If I'm trying to make something for a uh, device, the devices are here. So I'm going to say letter wide, for example. They'll give me a wide page. And then if I'm really trying to just come up with, an, are there transitions between clips? Yes, there's a whole transition area. Drag the transition in between the clips. Uh, but it's talking about rush. But anyway, let's go ahead and um, uh, start to lay out a page. So for example, let's say I want to put an image across the top of the top of the page. Well, I can just draw an X and that will create a frame for me to put that image across the top of the page. Then I can move it around with my finger and I can go ahead and uh, put that placeholder there. Let's say I now want to put a title in across this. Uh, so let's go ahead and just draw a line and put a dot and that will give me a placeholder for the text and I can go ahead and just put that there. Let's say that I want to put a paragraph text in now. One, two, three. And that will give me a uh, paragraph text that I can make smaller or bigger and I can get smart guys to align this. Let's say I want to put another image here and that will give me the placeholder for that image. And again, uh, doing everything very cool and very quickly. So Adobe Comp is awesome for this kind of work. Uh, so I can go ahead and now tap and I can go to my photos and I can go find a photo in my device, in my libraries, so forth and so on. So if I go to my libraries, Adobe Live 2020 that I've been working on all year, I can bring in, um, let's bring in this butterfly. And there's a butterfly shot from my Adobe library. If I want to change that text to change it to whatever I want to say, double tap, then edit the text. So that's what Comp is all about. It is literally a layout tool for you. Now, there's a problem with Comp right now. There's a bug that someone brought up. It's like, I saw your video, but I'm having a problem opening InDesign. Because what you would normally be able to do is you would tap, and then you would send it to your desktop if you wanted to work on it more. If you wanted to open an InDesign, Photoshop, Illustrator, um, or... Muse, I miss Muse. You, uh, I still use it, but you'd be able to open it up in any one of those applications. It would send it to your desktop, open the application, and where to go. But in that case, uh, InDesign right now, that, that transition is broken for some reason. It doesn't actually open in InDesign. However, you could share it as a PDF right now. So you could design and create right on your mobile device and create a flyer, create a layout, create a postcard, create an invite, create a whatever you want. Save it as a PDF and you got it. Share it. You can do it right on mobile. Um, but if you want to edit it in the other desktop apps, just note that they may not be connected right now in this very time and space. Uh, if you wanted to know what the gestures were, like I was doing an X, I was doing a line, how would I know what those are? You have your drawing gesture help to show you which ones they are and what you can do and not do. And if you want to delete something, scribble through it. If you wanted to make a uh, elliptical image, draw a circle with an X in it, so forth and so on. If you want to select something, draw a little lasso around the things you want to select. So very cool gestures. So uh, Comp is one of my favorite, favorite apps for just because it, it lets me do things that are very cool right on mobile. 
All right, and of course in this image, if I wanted to move this butterfly around, I can move the butterfly around, see more of the butterfly, less of the wing, uh, just like that, but it's just not really a great crop. Can of course move it around, resize it, do whatever I want. So we can go here, we'll do one more, uh, add another image to that, and we'll grab the bike image, and that pops the bike in right there. All right, uh, transition to desktop issue, issue, hopefully fixed soon. I agree, hopefully it is fixed soon. But in the meantime, you have a tool that lets you create and export PDFs directly on your mobile devices. All right, five minutes left. So that's Adobe Comp. That's uh, a tool, a cool tool. Here's one of the ones I did earlier. That one, I, that's the last one I think I recorded and sent it to the desktop, ready to edit uh, in InDesign. Here's another one. Just some cool things you can do. Right in comp. All right, getting out of comp. And uh, what did I forget? So I, I promised you one that I hadn't mentioned before. I, I don't think I've ever shown it before. I said it wasn't a creative tool. I'm just gonna talk about it in the next four minutes here that I have left. Let me get to it first. And it's free to use. There it is. Just wanna make sure I had it ready to go. And I think I'm going to switch to the desktop to show you this. So let's hide Lightroom. There it is. And let me show it to you. Okay, so I got my phone here. And the app that I'm talking about, not necessarily a creative app. Uh, I did not already talk about Spark, but I'm not going to be able to do Spark justice in four minutes. So if you want to hear Spark, go look at my last stream from Friday, where I talked about Spark a ton. So I, I like covered the whole video on Spark for an hour. So just head over to behance.net slash live and look at my Spark video from Friday where I talked about Spark in depth. Uh, you can go check it out there. All right, so anyway, Adobe Scan. So Adobe Scan is just as the name implies. It lets you use your mobile device as a scanner. And um, why is that important for, um, for creativity? It's not unless you need to send maybe your client a contract. You need to send your client um, an idea. You need to send your client something that you have created that um, you want to show them quickly, but it's in hard cover or hard, you know, it's in real format like paper. <laughs> so anyway, if I launch Adobe Scan, it, it basically allows me to create PDFs uh, directly from my camera. So if I go ahead and just tap the... Uh, the thing here, it looks for a document and look, it's already putting the handles in there and it already captured that document. So at that point, it's already decided what the page is. It's already like eliminated the stuff in the background. It's uh, if I hit continue, I could crop it even more, but it's got that ready to go. I can scan business cards. I can scan forms. I can scan white from a whiteboard. Um, you know, I want to scan a form. I'm going to go back to this. No, I don't want to do that. Hang on, don't allow yet. No, 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 not now. There we go. I want to go back to this. And at this point, if I were to save this as a PDF, not only is it saving it as a PDF that you could just share, but it's also recognizing the text in it. So the text would be searchable. So just keep that in mind if you're looking for um, a quick way to use paper or scan documents or your mail or anything you get that you need to keep a digital copy of, Adobe Scan, go download it from iOS or, or Android app stores and start using it for free. Uh, again, create a PDF, share that PDF, comment on a PDF, all of that's built into Adobe Scan. So I love, love, love Scan. I used it to file all my taxes, just scanning all those 1099s and documents and everything that I need to send. Yes, you can crop it too, absolutely. All right, so that's Adobe Scan, and I have like one minute left, and I know the person asked about Post, and I said I don't have time to do it justice, and I really don't, but Spark Post is an amazing tool. I highly recommend you go look at my video from Friday where you can see me talk about Post and Page and even Spark Video in depth. But basically, in a nutshell, in a one-minute description, Post lets you create beautiful posts for social media without having to necessarily be a designer. Uh, comp, you create it from a blank page. Spark post, you're creating from a template. So if you were to tap on, I'm just going to randomly pick one here. If you were to tap on a template and you remix that template, then everything in that template is now accessible for you to do whatever you want to do with it. So if I want to edit the text, 
tap, oh, that's an icon actually. Tap the text, trust me, <laughs> not, not yourself, trust me. There you go. So I just changed the text. If I want to change the image, I can change the image, the icons or anything around this, move this stuff around and I can click quickly and easily um, export this out and save it and resize it for social media and do all the things I want it. So if I need that to be an Instagram story, resize it quickly to an Instagram story. I need that to be a landscape photo or landscape post, resize it to landscape and it quickly does that for me and tons more. So if you want to know more about Spark, go check out my Spark uh, video from Friday on my masterclass at behance.net slash live. Look at my Friday. The Spark icon is right on the thumbnail and you guys will be able to check out all about Spark. Sorry I didn't get more to it, more into it today, but since I talked about Spark before, I thought it'd be more important to show you Adobe Scan in those few minutes that we had since I've done Spark several times. All right. So with that said, cheers, everybody. Thanks for, um, thanks for uh, joining me today. And thanks for uh, being creative on mobile. So that's the end of our two parts. Up next is going to be the daily creative challenge. Bye, everybody. Have a good one.